Chapter One of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume One, Chapter One Americans on a Visit to the Emperor of Russia. Yalta, Russia, August 26, 1867. The passengers on board the American steamship Quaker City have been paying a pleasant informal visit to His Majesty, the autocrat of all the Russias, at his summer palace near this village. We were not smothered with attentions at Constantinople. America is in bad odor there, on account of her outspoken sympathy with the Cretans. But we found a different atmosphere in Russia. At Sebastopol we were received with great cordiality and were not even asked to show our passports, a singular thing to occur in a Russian port. We were surprised because we had been warned that those documents would be called for and strictly scrutinized about every forty minutes while we remained in the Tsar's territories. One of the passengers began to inquire into the matter. The Russian officer he spoke to explained it in a very few words, and very gracefully he said, "'Yonder is your passport.' The flag you are flying is sufficient. The Sebastopolitans said the Emperor of Russia was spending the summer at the little watering place of Yalta, forty miles away, and warmly recommended us to take the ship there and visit him. They said they could ensure us a kind reception. They insisted on telegraphing and also sending a courier overland to announce us but we had been told that the great viceroy of egypt had had his visit there almost for nothing a few days before and we were modest enough to have our doubts so we went our way to odessa two hundred miles distant again we were well received and again they said go and see the emperor finally the governor-general telegraphed the court a prompt reply was returned and we sailed toward yalta a great question had to be solved. What is to be done, and how are we to do it? We had the United States Consul on board, the Odessa Consul. We assembled all hands in the cabin, and commanded him to tell us what we must do to be saved, and tell us quickly. He made a speech. The first thing he said fell like a blight upon every hopeful spirit. He had never seen a court reception three groans for the consul. But he said he had seen receptions at the governor-general's in Odessa, and had often listened to people's experiences of receptions at the Russian and various other courts, and believed he knew pretty well what sort of ordeal we were about to essay. Hope budded again. He said we were many. The summer palace was small, a mere mansion doubtless we should be received in summer fashion in the garden we would stand in a row all the gentlemen in swallow-tail coats white kids white neckties and the ladies in light-colored silks or something of that kind at the proper moment twelve meridian the emperor attended by his suite arrayed in splendid uniforms would appear and walk slowly along the line bowing to some and saying two or three words to others at the moment his majesty appeared a universal delighted enthusiastic smile ought to break out like an epidemic among the passengers a smile of love of gratification of admiration and with one accord the party must begin to bow not obsequiously but respectfully and with dignity and at the end of fifteen minutes the emperor would go in the house and we could shin along home again we felt immensely relieved it seemed in a manner easy there wasn't a man in the party but believed that with a little practice he could stand in a row especially if there were others along there wasn't a man but believed he could bow without tripping on his coat-tail and breaking his neck in a word we came to believe we were equal to any item in the performance except that complicated smile the council also said that we ought to draft a little address to the emperor and present it to one of his aides-de-camp uh, who would forward it to him at the proper time therefore 
five of us were appointed to prepare the document and the fifty others went sadly smiling about the ship during the next twelve hours we had the general appearance somehow of being at a funeral where everybody was sorry the death had occurred but glad it was over where everybody was smiling and yet broken-hearted the consul's closing statement was that it would be etiquette to invite the emperor to visit the ship and that he would respectfully decline as usual a committee went ashore to wait on his excellency the governor-general and learn our fate at the end of three hours of boding suspense they came back and said the emperor would receive us at noon the next day would send carriages for us would hear the address in person the grand duke michael had sent to invite us to his palace also both desired to visit the ship the following day with their families the weather permitting counterfeited smiles never gave place to real ones so suddenly before any man could see that there was an intention here to show that russia's friendship for america was so genuine as to render even her private citizens objects worthy of kindly attentions at the appointed hour we drove out three miles and assembled in the handsome garden in front of the emperor's palace in five minutes the autocrat came out and with him the empress the grand duchess marie her daughter a pretty blue-eyed fair-haired girl of fourteen and a little grand duke about ten years old with them came a few princes and great dignitaries in handsome but not gaudy uniforms we took off our hats i smiled a reckless smile at the finest uniform but i found it was only the lord high admiral and so i had to smile it all over again if i had had any sense i might have known that the imperial family would be the plainest dressed personages on the spot the consul read the address to the emperor and then handed it to me he said a word or two in reply and passed the document to a court dignitary this is the address to his imperial majesty alexander the second emperor of russia we are a handful of private citizens of america traveling simply for recreation and unostentatiously as becomes our unofficial state and therefore we have no excuse to tender for presenting ourselves before your majesty save the desire of offering our grateful acknowledgments to the lord of a realm which through good and through evil report has been the steadfast friend of the land we love so well we could not presume to take a step like this did we not know well that the words we speak here and the sentiments wherewith they are freighted are but the reflex of the thoughts and feelings of all our countrymen from the green hills of new england to the shores of the far pacific we are few in number but we utter the voice of a nation one of the brightest pages that has graced the world's history since written history had its birth was recorded by your majesty's hand when it loosed the bonds of twenty millions of men and americans can but esteem it a privilege to do honor to a ruler who has wrought so great a deed the lesson that was taught us then we have profited by and we are free in truth today even as we were before in name america owes much to russia is indebted to her in many ways and chiefly for her unwavering friendship in seasons of our greatest need that that friendship may still be hers in times to come we confidently pray that she is and will be grateful to russia and to her sovereign for it we know full well that she will ever forfeit it by any unpremeditated unjust act or unfair course it were treason to believe samuel l clemens william gibson timothy d crocker s a sanford colonel p kinney u s a committee on behalf of the passengers of the steamer quaker city the emperor had on a white cloth cap and white cloth coat and pantaloons all of questionable fineness the empress and her daughter wore simple suits of foulard with a little blue spot in it blue trimmings low-crowned straw hats trimmed with blue velvet linen collars 
clerical neckties of muslin blue sashes flesh-colored gloves parasols lady readers will take due notice the exceeding simplicity of these dresses would ensure them against creating a sensation in broadway the little grand duke wore a red calico blouse and a straw hat and had his pantaloons tucked into his boots simplicity of costume and kingly stateliness of manner cannot go very well together and i was curious to see how the imperial party would act they acted as if they had never been used to anything finer they were as free from any semblance of pride or haughtiness as if their house had always been a village minister's house they conversed freely and unconstrainedly with anybody and everybody that came along they all speak english and so did the great officers of the empire that were with them our party of americans who were so distressed the day before as to how they were going to get through this severe trial with credit suddenly found themselves entirely at home and comfortable the fifteen minutes audience pleasantly augmented itself to half an hour and then instead of dismissing the guests the autocrat of all the rushes and his family transformed themselves into ushers and led our tribe into the palace dining-room into the library the private chapel the sitting-rooms private writing-rooms all over the establishment in fact i cannot recollect half the places there was no hurry there were plenty of affable dukes and princes and admirals to answer questions and this part of the program insensibly wore out another half hour and something over when there was nothing more to see the imperial family bade the guests good-bye till to-morrow and we departed for the palace of the grand duke michael the young grand duchess however went to another door and bowed at the party in detail as they passed by if you have ever called on an emperor you will remember that little attentions not strictly in the bill were the very ones that went furthest toward making you feel comfortable that young girl's pleasant face its expression of friendly interest and her timid bow were not calculated to make any one feel like a tiresome nuisance in my own case i know this was so it struck me forcibly at the time that i had seldom felt so little like a nuisance before it is singular but for the moment i forgot that before all this leave-taking occurred we were invited to the palace of the crown prince of russia aged twenty and shown all through it with the same absence of hurry as was the case at his father's mansion a drive of twenty minutes brought us to the beautiful park and gardens and the elegant palace of the grand duke michael the first persons we saw there were the empress and her daughter they had come by a nearer road i suppose whether justly or not we chose to consider this as a mark that they were not altogether tired of us yet the introduction to the grand duke and his duchess was hardly over when the emperor arrived himself this was about as cheerful as it could be he caught up his brother's little children and kissed them affectionately i could not help noticing that because it was so little like what we had reason to expect from the stern russian bear we read about so much the grand duchess was as simply dressed as the empress was as gentle and unreserved and as ready to talk with everybody her husband was just like her in these respects a splendid-looking man over six feet high well formed and endowed with as kindly a presence as one could wish to see he wore a handsome cossack uniform and looked the military commander to a charm he it was who crushed out in a two months campaign the caucasian war that had lasted sixty years and won the coveted first-degree cross of the order of st george the only man who has been so decorated in two hundred years it is a distinction that can be achieved but the terms are not easy dauntless courage exalted military genius and success there was but little ceremony here we were shown through the palace in the free and easy way we had already got accustomed to and then our friends the princes and generals and baronesses conducted the gang all about the lawns and groves of the park i enjoyed it 
I had reached my level at last. If there is one thing I am naturally fitted for, it is to converse with dukes. I got along well. They could not understand the subtleties of an American joke, it is true, and so they generally laughed in the wrong place. However, it wasn't any matter. They were inferior jokes anyhow, and some of them were old. Some of us lingered in the grounds a good while, and when we got back we found the balance of the mob scattered about the reception room and the verandas, sitting at little tables and drinking tea and wine and eating bread and cheese and cold meats with the Grand Duke, who ate at one table a while and then at another, and kept the conversation and the destruction of provisions going with a zeal which was perfectly astonishing in the brother of an emperor. I did not suppose that the brothers of autocrats were so much like other people. Some people have curious ways about them. This sort of thing may have suited His Imperial Highness, but if I were a Grand Duke I wouldn't eat with those varlets. As the circumstances stood, however, I took a hand. They give you a lemon to squeeze into your tea there, or iced milk if you prefer it. The former is best. The Grand Duke's tea was delicious. It is brought overland from China. It injures the article to transport it by sea. Well, to cut a long story short, it was a chatty, sociable tea party, and free from restraint. Whoever chose got up and walked about and talked, and in all human probability would have been allowed to whistle if he had wanted to. And it was a pleasant picnic all through, from the time we left the ship till we got back again. We had spent nearly half a day with the heads of the Russian Empire, and it had seemed as if we were merely visiting a party of ordinary friends. There was not one of them but had said the kindest things about America, and said them with an earnestness that proved their sincerity. Not one but had done everything he could to make us feel contented and at home. I fear for our less liberal hospitality. If they visit the ships they will find a sign up, no smoking abaft the wheel. But the Grand Duke passed around his box of cigars in his own reception room. And there was another incident that shows how little he was inclined to put on airs, and how genuine the seeming cordiality of our reception was. This lordly brother of an emperor, and himself sub-chief of half an empire, came down on his horse to Yalta three miles when we first came ashore, and escorted our procession all the way to the palace, keeping a sharp lookout, and dispatching his aides hither and thither to furnish assistance whenever it was needed. And being dressed in an unpretentious uniform, nobody ever suspected who he was until we recognized him in his own palace. I doubt if he goes about escorting a rabble of plain civilians every day. You may possibly think that our party tarried too long or did other improper things, but such was not the case. Their going and coming and all their movements were quietly regulated by the imperial master of ceremonies. Mr. M. Curtin, our secretary of legation at St. Petersburg, was present, and his advice was frequently asked and followed. The company felt that they were occupying an unusually responsible position. They were representing the people of America, not the government and therefore they were especially anxious to perform their high mission with credit. On the other hand, the imperial families no doubt considered that in entertaining us they were more especially entertaining the people of America than they could by showering attentions on the whole platoon of ministers plenipotentiary, and therefore they gave to the event its fullest significance as an expression of good will and friendly feeling toward the entire country. We took the kindnesses we received as attentions thus directed, of course, and not to ourselves as a party. That we felt a personal pride in being received as the representatives of a great people, we do not deny. That we felt a national pride in the warm cordiality of that reception cannot be doubted. The address and an account of the proceedings have already been forwarded to various Russian newspapers for publication and thus our little holiday adventure is invested with a degree of political significance. It is well. We represented only the true feeling of America toward Russia when we thanked her, through her chief, 
for her valuable friendship in times past and hoped that it would continue the sea was very rough to-day but still many russian nobles civilians and officers of the army and navy have visited the ship among them were baron wrangel formerly russian ambassador at washington the admiral and several vice-admirals of the russian fleets and general tottleben the honored defender for eighteen trying months of sebastopol for his distinguished services there he has been decorated with the crosses of the third and fourth degree of the order of st george by invitation we visited the empress's yacht this morning and afterward brought back the captains of that vessel and of one of the emperor's yachts to breakfast with us we have visitors on board all the time and if we only had the boundless politeness these russians are naturally gifted with we could entertain them well they are able to make themselves pleasant company whether they speak one's language or not but our tribe can't think of anything to do or say when they get hold of a subject of the czar who knows only his own language however one of our ladies from cleveland ohio is a notable exception to this rule she escorts russian ladies about the ship and talks and laughs with them and makes them feel at home they comprehend no word she utters but they understand the good will and the friendliness that are in the tones of her voice i wish we had more like her they all try but none succeed so well as she the emperor is very tall and slender spare one may say and his bearing is full of dignity and easy self-possession an unbending will is stamped upon his face and yet when he smiles his blue eyes are as gentle as a woman's his hair and whiskers are very light he is forty-eight years old but looks about fifty-three or fifty-four the grand duke michael is very tall and well shaped has a blue eye that must beam with a wicked light when he is angry though it is lively and pleasant enough under peaceable circumstances his whiskers and moustache a modification of the dundreary pattern are light and he cuts his hair as close as plush and don't curl it he is as straight as an indian and if ever a man looked what they call born to command he does his is the stateliest figure in europe i am willing to believe his courtly grace his fine military bearing his varied accomplishments and his knightly achievements make of him a russian sir philip sidney he is greatly beloved in russia the czar and his brother would be marked in a crowd as great men and good ones the emperor napoleon would be marked in a crowd as a great man and a cunning one the sultan of turkey would not be marked in a crowd at all i want to see one more assortment of kings and average them and then i shall be satisfied the day is drawing to a close and the sea is so rough that the emperor will certainly not visit the ship baron ungern sternberg the director of all the russian railways has come on board and is evidently at home with the passengers he has traveled a great deal in america he is preparing to web the empire with railroads prince dolgoruki and count festetix members of the emperor's court are also here and we are getting ready to fire a salute for the governor-general who will be along directly with his family they are laying carpets on the pier for them to walk on they might have done that for the poet but i suppose they didn't know he was here we shall have a champagne spree directly i suppose and then bid our guests and russia farewell and sail for the sublime port we have got so used to princes now that it is going to be hard work during the next few days to get down to the level of the common herd again mark twain End of chapter 1. Americans on a Visit to the Emperor of Russia. Read by John Greenman. This is section 2 of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Austrian Edison Keeping School Again by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman by a paragraph in the fray presse it appears that jan stepanik the youthful inventor of the telelectroscope for seeing at great distances and some other scientific marvels 
as been having an odd adventure by help of the state vienna is hospitably ready to smile whenever there is an opportunity and this seems to be a fair one three or four years ago when schipanik was nineteen or twenty years old he was a schoolmaster in a moravian village on a salary of uh, i forget the amount but no matter there was not enough of it to remember his head was full of inventions and in his odd hours he began to plan them out he soon perfected an ingenious invention for applying photography to pattern designing as used in the textile industries whereby he proposed to reduce the customary outlay of time labor and money expended on that department of loom work to next to nothing he wanted to carry his project to vienna and market it and as he could not get leave of absence he made his trip without leave this lost him his place but did not gain him his market when his money ran out he went back home and was presently reinstated by and by he deserted once more and went to vienna and this time he made some friends who assisted him and his invention was sold to england and germany for a great sum during the past three years he has been experimenting and investigating in velvety comfort his most picturesque achievement is his telelectroscope a device which a number of able men including mr edison i think had already tried their hands at with prospects of eventual success a frenchman came near to solving the difficult and intricate problem fifteen years ago but an essential detail was lacking which he could not master and he suffered defeat Stepanik's experiments with his pattern designing project revealed to him the secret of the lacking detail he perfected his invention and a french syndicate has bought it and will save it for exhibition and fortune-making at the paris world's fair when the fair opens by and by as a schoolmaster Stepanik was exempt from military duty when he ceased from teaching being an educated man he could have had himself enrolled as a one year's volunteer but he forgot to do it and this exposed him to the privilege and also the necessity of serving three years in the army in the course of duty the other day an official discovered the inventor's indebtedness to the state and took the proper measures to collect at first there seemed to be no way for the inventor and the state out of the difficulty the authorities were loath to take the young man out of his great laboratory where he was helping to shove the whole human race along on its road to new prosperities and scientific conquests and suspend operations in his mental klondike three years while he punched the empty air with a bayonet in a time of peace but there was the law and how was it to be helped it was a difficult puzzle but the authorities labored at it until they found a forgotten law somewhere which furnished a loophole a large one and a long one too as it looks to me by this piece of good luck Stepanik is saved from soldiering but he becomes a schoolmaster again and it is a sufficiently picturesque billet when you examine it he must go back to his village every two months and teach his school half a day from early in the morning until noon and to the best of my understanding of the published terms he must keep this up the rest of his life i hope so just for the romantic poeticalness of it he is twenty-four strongly and compactly built and comes to an ancestry accustomed to waiting to see its great-grandchildren married it is almost certain that he will live to be ninety i hope so this promises him sixty-six years of useful school service dissected it gives him a chance to teach school three hundred and ninety-six half days make three hundred and ninety-six railway trips going and three hundred and ninety-six back pay bed and board three hundred and ninety-six times in the village and lose possibly one thousand two hundred days from his laboratory work that is to say three years and three months or so and he already owes three years to this same account 
this has been overlooked. I shall call the attention of the authorities to it. It may be possible for him to get a compromise on this compromise by doing his three years in the army and saving one. But I think it can't happen. This government holds the age on him. It has what is technically called a good thing in financial circles, and knows a good thing when it sees it. I know the inventor very well, and he has my sympathy. This is friendship, but I am throwing my influence with the government. This is politics. Stepanik left for his village in Moravia day before yesterday to do time for the first time under his sentence. Early yesterday morning he started for the school in a fine carriage which was stocked with fruits, cakes, toys, and all sorts of knick-knacks, rarities, and surprises for the children, and was met on the road by the school and a body of schoolmasters from the neighboring districts, marching in column, with the village authorities at the head, and was received with the enthusiastic welcome proper to the man who had made their village's name celebrated, and conducted in state to the humble doors which had been shut against him as a deserter three years before. It is out of materials like these that romances are woven, and when the romancer has done his best, he has not improved upon the unpainted facts. Stepanik put the sapless school-books aside, and led the children a holiday dance through the enchanted lands of science and invention, explaining to them some of the curious things which he had contrived, and the laws which governed their construction and performance, and illustrating these matters with pictures and models and other helps to a clear understanding of their fascinating mysteries. After this there was play, and a distribution of the fruits and toys and things, and after this again some more science, including the story of the invention of the telephone, and an explanation of its character and laws, for the convict had brought a telephone along. The children saw that wonder for the first time, and they also personally tested its powers and verified them. Then school let out. The teacher got his certificate, all signed, stamped, taxed, and so on, said good-bye, and drove off in his carriage under a storm of Dovizenia, au revoir, from the children, who will resume their customary sobrieties until he comes in August and uncorks his flask of scientific firewater again. End of The Austrian Edison Keeping School Again by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman This is Section 3 of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume 1. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Canvasser's Tale by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman Poor sad-eyed stranger! There was that about his humble mien, his tired look, his decayed gentility clothes, that almost reached the mustard seed of charity that still remained, remote and lonely, in the empty vastness of my heart, notwithstanding I observed a portfolio under his arm, and said to myself, Behold, Providence hath delivered his servant into the hands of another canvasser. Well, these people always get one interested. Before I well knew how it came about, this one was telling me his history, and I was all attention and sympathy. He told it something like this. My parents died, alas, when I was a little sinless child. My uncle, Ithuriel, took me to his heart, and reared me as his own. He was my only relative in the wide world, but he was good and rich and generous. He reared me in the lap of luxury. I knew no want that money could satisfy. In the fullness of time I was graduated, and went with two of my servants, my chamberlain and my valet, to travel in foreign countries. During four years I flitted upon careless wing amid the beauteous gardens of the distant strand, if you will permit this form of speech in one whose tongue was ever attuned to poesy, 
and indeed i so speak with confidence as one unto his kind for i perceive by your eyes that you too sir are gifted with the divine inflation in those far lands i reveled in the ambrosial food that fructifies the soul the mind the heart but of all things that which most appealed to my inborn aesthetic taste was the prevailing custom there among the rich of making collections of elegant and costly rarities dainty objets de vertu and in an evil hour i tried to uplift my uncle ethuriel to a plane of sympathy with this exquisite employment i wrote and told him of one gentleman's vast collection of shells another's noble collection of meerschaum pipes another's elevating and refining collection of undecipherable autographs another's priceless collection of old china another's enchanting collection of postage stamps and so forth and so on soon my letters yielded fruit my uncle began to look about for something to make a collection of you may know perhaps how fleetly a taste like this dilates his soon became a raging fever though i knew it not he began to neglect his great pork business presently he wholly retired and turned an elegant leisure into a rabid search for curious things his wealth was vast and he spared it not first he tried cow-bells he made a collection which filled five large salons and comprehended all the different sorts of cow-bells that ever had been contrived save one that one an antique and the only specimen extant was possessed by another collector my uncle offered enormous sums for it but the gentleman would not sell doubtless you know what necessarily resulted a true collector attaches no value to a collection that is not complete his great heart breaks he sells his hoard he turns his mind to some field that seems unoccupied thus did my uncle he next tried brickbats after piling up a vast and intensely interesting collection the former difficulty supervened his great heart broke again he sold out his soul's idol to the retired brewer who possessed the missing brick then he tried flint hatchets and other implements of primeval man but by and by discovered that the factory where they were made was supplying other collectors as well as himself he tried aztec inscriptions and stuffed whales another failure after incredible labor and expense when his collection seemed at last perfect a stuffed whale arrived from greenland and an aztec inscription from the cundurango regions of central america that made all former specimens insignificant my uncle hastened to secure these noble gems he got the stuffed whale but another collector got the inscription a real cundurango as possibly you know is a possession of such supreme value that when once a collector gets it he will rather part with his family than with it so my uncle sold out and saw his darlings go forth never more to return and his coal-black hair turned white as snow in a single night now he waited and thought he knew another disappointment might kill him he was resolved that he would choose things next time that no other man was collecting he carefully made up his mind and once more entered the field this time to make a collection of echoes of what said i echoes sir his first purchase was an echo in georgia that repeated four times his next was a six repeater in maryland his next was a thirteen repeater in maine his next was a nine repeater in kansas his next was a twelve repeater in tennessee which he got cheap so to speak because it was out of repair a portion of the crag which reflected it having tumbled down he believed he could repair it at a cost of a few thousand dollars and by increasing the elevation with masonry treble the repeating capacity but the architect who undertook the job 
had never built an echo before, and so he utterly spoiled this one. Before he meddled with it, it used to talk back like a mother-in-law, and now it was only fit for the deaf and dumb asylum. Well, next he bought a lot of cheap little double-barreled echoes, scattered around over various states and territories. He got them at twenty per cent off by taking the lot. Next he bought a perfect gatling gun of an echo in Oregon, and it cost a fortune, I can tell you. You may know, sir, that in the echo market the scale of prices is cumulative, like the carat scale in diamonds. In fact, the same phraseology is used. A single carat echo is worth but ten dollars over and above the value of the land it is on. A two-carat or double-barreled echo is worth thirty dollars. A five-carat is worth nine hundred and fifty. A ten-carat is worth thirteen thousand. My uncle's Oregon echo, which he called the Great Pit Echo, was a twenty-two-carat gem, and cost two hundred and sixteen thousand dollars. They threw the land in, for it was four hundred miles from a settlement. Well, in the meantime my path was a path of roses. I was the accepted suitor of the only and lovely daughter of an English earl, and was beloved to distraction. In that dear presence I swam in seas of bliss. The family were content, for it was known that I was sole heir to an uncle held to be worth five millions of dollars. However, none of us knew that my uncle had become a collector at least in anything more than a small way, for aesthetic amusement. Now gathered the clouds above my unconscious head. That divine echo, since known throughout the world as the great Kohinoor, or mountain of repetitions, was discovered. You could utter a word, and it would talk back at you for fifteen minutes when the day was otherwise quiet. But, behold, Another discovery was made at the same time. Another echo-collector was in the field. The two rushed to make the purchase. The property consisted of a couple of small hills with a shallow swale between out yonder among the back settlements of New York State. Both men arrived on the ground at the same time, and neither knew the other was there. The echo was not all owned by one man. A person by the name of Williamson Bolivar Jarvis owned the East Hill, and a person by the name of Harbison J. Bledsoe owned the West Hill. The swale between was the dividing line. So, while my uncle was buying Jarvis's hill for three million two hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars, the other party was buying Bledsoe's hill for a shade over three million. Now, do you perceive the natural result? Why, the noblest collection of echoes on earth was forever and ever incomplete, since it possessed but the one half of the king echo of the universe. Neither man was content with this divided ownership, yet neither would sell to the other. There were jawings, bickerings, heart-burnings, and at last that other collector— with a malignity which only a collector can ever feel toward a man and a brother, proceeded to cut down his hill. You see, as long as he could not have the echo, he was resolved that nobody should have it. He would remove his hill, and then there would be nothing to reflect my uncle's echo. My uncle remonstrated with him, but the man said, I own one end of this echo. I choose to kill my end. You must take care of your own end yourself. Well, my uncle got an injunction put on him. The other man appealed and fought it in a higher court. They carried it on up clear to the Supreme Court of the United States. It made no end of trouble there. Two of the judges believed that an echo was personal property, because it was impalpable to sight and touch and yet was purchasable, saleable, and consequently taxable. Two others believed that an echo was real estate, because it was manifestly attached to the land, and was not removable from place to place. Other of the judges contended that 
an echo was not property at all it was finally decided that the echo was property that the hills were property that the two men were separate and independent owners of the two hills but tenants in common in the echo therefore defendant was at full liberty to cut down his hill since it belonged solely to him but must give bonds in three million dollars as indemnity for damages which might result to my uncle's half of the echo this decision also debarred my uncle from using his defendant's hill to reflect his part of the echo without defendant's consent he must use only his own hill if his part of the echo would not go under these circumstances it was sad of course but the court could find no remedy the court also debarred defendant from using my uncle's hill to reflect his end of the echo without consent you see the grand result neither man would give consent and so that astonishing and most noble echo had to cease from its great powers and since that day that magnificent property is tied up and unsaleable a week before my wedding day while i was still swimming in bliss and the nobility were gathering from far and near to honor our espousals came news of my uncle's death and also a copy of his will making me his sole heir he was gone alas my dear benefactor was no more the thought surcharges my heart even at this remote day i handed the will to the earl i could not read it for the blinding tears the earl read it then he sternly said sir do you call this wealth but doubtless you do in your inflated country sir you are left sole heir to a vast collection of echoes if a thing can be called a collection that is scattered far and wide over the huge length and breadth of the american continent sir that is not all you are head and ears in debt there is not an echo in the lot but has a mortgage on it sir i am not a hard man but i must look to my child's interest if you had but one echo which you could honestly call your own if you had but one echo which was free from encumbrance so that you could retire to it with my child and by humble painstaking industry cultivate and improve it and thus wrest from it a maintenance i would not say you nay but i cannot marry my child to a beggar leave his side my darling go sir take your mortgage-ridden echoes and quit my sight forever my noble celestine clung to me in tears with loving arms and swore she would willingly nay gladly marry me though i had not an echo in the world but it could not be we were torn asunder she to pine and die within the twelvemonth i to toil life's long journey sad and lone praying daily hourly for that release which shall join us together again in that dear realm where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest now sir if you will be so kind as to look at these maps and plans in my portfolio i am sure i can sell you an echo for less money than any man in the trade now this one which cost my uncle ten dollars thirty years ago and is one of the sweetest things in texas i will let you have for let me interrupt you i said my friend i have not had a moment's respite from canvassers this day i have bought a sewing machine which i did not want i have bought a map which is mistaken in all its details i have bought a clock which will not go i have bought a moth poison which the moths prefer to any other beverage i have bought no end of useless inventions and now i have had enough of this foolishness i would not have one of your echoes if you were even to give it to me i would not let it stay on the place i always hate a man that tries to sell me echoes you see this gun now take your collection and move on let us not have bloodshed but he only smiled a sad sweet smile and got out some more diagrams you know the result perfectly well because you know that when you have once opened the door to a canvasser 
the trouble is done and you have got to suffer defeat i compromised with this man at the end of an intolerable hour i bought two double-barreled echoes in good condition and he threw in another which he said was not saleable because it only spoke german he said she was a perfect polyglot once but somehow her palate got down mark twain end of the canvasser's tale read by john greenman This is Section 4 of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume 1, read by John Greenman. The Tsar's Soliloquy by Mark Twain After the Tsar's morning bath, it is his habit to meditate an hour before dressing himself. London Times Correspondence Viewing himself in the pier glass. Naked, what am I? A lank, skinny, spider-legged libel on the image of god look at the wax-work head the face with the expression of a melon the projecting ears the knotted elbows the dished breast the knife-edged shins and then the feet all beads and joints and bone sprays an imitation x-ray photograph there is nothing a imperial about this nothing imposing impressive nothing to invoke awe and reverence is it this that a hundred and forty million russians kiss the dust before and worship manifestly not no one could worship this spectacle which is me then who is it what is it that they worship privately none knows better than i it is my clothes without my clothes i should be as destitute of authority as any other naked person nobody could tell me from a parson a barber a dude then who is the real emperor of russia my clothes there is no other as teufelstrock suggested what would man be what would any man be without his clothes as soon as one stops and thinks over that proposition one realizes that without his clothes a man would be nothing at all that the clothes do not merely make the man the clothes are the man that without them he is a cipher a vacancy a nobody a nothing titles another artificiality are a part of his clothing they and the dry goods conceal the wearer's inferiority and make him seem great and a wonder when at bottom there is nothing remarkable about him they can move a nation to fall on its knees and sincerely worship an emperor who without the clothes and the title would drop to the rank of the cobbler and be swallowed up and lost sight of in the massed multitude of the inconsequentials an emperor who naked in a naked world would get no notice excite no remark and be heedlessly shouldered and jostled like any other uncertified stranger and perhaps offered a kopeck to carry somebody's gripsack yet an emperor who by the sheer might of those artificialities clothes and a title can get himself worshipped as a deity by his people and at his pleasure and unrebuked can exile them hunt them harry them destroy them just as he would with so many rats if the accident of birth had furnished him a calling better suited to his capacities than emperoring it is a stupendous force that which resides in the all-concealing cloak of clothes and title they fill the onlooker with awe they make him tremble yet he knows that every hereditary regal dignity commemorates a usurpation a power illegitimately acquired an authority conveyed and conferred by persons who did not own it for monarchs have been chosen and elected by aristocracies only 
a nation has never elected one there is no power without clothes it is the power that governs the human race strip its chiefs to the skin and no state could be governed naked officials could exercise no authority they would look and be like everybody else commonplace inconsequential a policeman in plain clothes is one man in his uniform he is ten clothes and title are the most potent thing the most formidable influence in the earth they move the human race to willing and spontaneous respect for the judge the general the admiral the bishop the ambassador the frivolous earl the idiot duke the sultan the king the emperor no great title is efficient without clothes to support it in naked tribes of savages the kings wear some kind of rag or decoration which they make sacred to themselves and allow no one else to wear the king of the great fan tribe wears a bit of leopard skin on his shoulder it is sacred to royalty the rest of him is perfectly naked without his bit of leopard skin to awe and impress the people he would not be able to keep his job after a silence a curious invention an unaccountable invention the human race the swarming russian millions have for centuries meekly allowed our family to rob them insult them trample them underfoot while they lived and suffered and died with no purpose and no function but to make that family comfortable these people are horses just that horses with clothes and a religion a horse with the strength of a hundred men will let one man beat him starve him drive him the russian millions allow a mere handful of soldiers to hold them in slavery and these very soldiers are their own sons and brothers a strange thing when one considers it to it the world applies to czar and system the same moral axioms that have vogue and acceptance in civilized countries because in civilized countries it is wrong to remove oppressors otherwise than by process of law it is held that the same rule applies in russia where there is no such thing as law except for our family laws are merely restraints they have no other function in civilized countries they restrain all persons and restrain them all alike which is fair and righteous but in russia such laws as exist make an exception our family we do as we please we have done as we pleased for centuries our common trade has been crime our common pastime murder our common beverage blood the blood of the nation upon our heads lie millions of murders yet the pious moralist says it is a crime to assassinate us we and our uncles are a family of cobras set over a hundred and forty million rabbits whom we torture and murder and feed upon all our days yet the moralist urges that to kill us is a crime not a duty it is not for me to say it aloud but to one on the inside like me this is naively funny on its face illogical our family is above all law there is no law that can reach us restrain us protect the people from us therefore we are outlaws outlaws are a proper mark for anyone's bullet ah what could our family do without the moralist he has always been our stay our support our friend today he is our only friend whenever there has been dark talk of assassination he has come forward and saved us with his impressive maxim forbear nothing politically valuable was ever yet achieved by violence 
he probably believes it it is because he has by him no child's book of world history to teach him that his maxim lacks the backing of statistics all thrones have been established by violence no regal tyranny has ever been overthrown except by violence by violence my fathers set up our throne by murder treachery perjury torture banishment and the prison they have held it for four centuries and by these same arts i hold it to-day there is no romanoff of learning and experience but would reverse the maxim and say nothing politically valuable was ever yet achieved except by violence the moralist realizes that to-day for the first time in our history my throne is in real peril and the nation waking up from its immemorial slave lethargy but he does not perceive that four deeds of violence are the reason for it the assassination of the finland constitution by my hand the slaughter by revolutionary assassins of bobrikov and Pleve, and my massacre of the unoffending innocents the other day but the blood that flows in my veins blood informed trained educated by its grim heredities blood alert by its traditions blood which has been to school four hundred years in the veins of professional assassins my predecessors it perceives it understands those four deeds have set up a commotion in the inert and muddy deeps of the national heart such as no moral suasion could have accomplished they have aroused hatred and hope in that long atrophied heart and little by little slowly but surely that feeling will steal into every breast and possess it in time into even the soldier's breast fatal day day of doom that by and by there will be results how little the academical moralist knows of the tremendous moral force of massacre and assassination indeed there are going to be results the nation is in labor and by and by there will be a mighty birth patriotism to put it in rude plain unpalatable words true patriotism real patriotism loyalty not to a family and a fiction but loyalty to the nation itself there are twenty-five million families in russia there is a man-child at every mother's knee if these were twenty-five million patriotic mothers they would teach these man-children daily saying remember this take it to heart live by it die for it if necessary that our patriotism is medieval outworn obsolete that the modern patriotism the true patriotism the only rational patriotism is loyalty to the nation all of the time loyalty to the government when it deserves it with twenty-five million taught and trained patriots in the land a, a generation from now my successor would think twice before he would butcher a thousand helpless poor petitioners humbly begging for his kindness and justice as i did the other day reflective pause well perhaps i have been affected by these depressing newspaper clippings which i found under my pillow i will read and ponder them again reads polish women knouted reservists wives treated with awful brutality at least one killed special cable to the new york times berlin november twenty seven infuriated by the unwillingness of the polish troops to leave their wives and children the russian authorities at kutno a town on the polish frontier have treated the people in a manner almost incredibly cruel it is known that one woman has been knouted to death and that a number of others have been injured fifty persons have been thrown into jail some of the prisoners were tortured into unconsciousness 
details of the brutalities are lacking but it seems that the cossacks tore the reservists from the arms of their wives and children and then knouted the women who followed their husbands into the streets in cases where reservists could not be found their wives were dragged by their hair into the streets and there beaten the chief official of the district and the colonel of a regiment are said to have looked on while this was being done a girl who had assisted in distributing socialist tracts was treated in an atrocious manner czar as lords anointed people spent night in prayer and fasting before his visit to novgorod london times new york times special cablegram copyright 1904 the new york times london july 27 the london times russian correspondents say the following extract from the petersburger zeitung describing the czar's recent doings at novgorod affords a typical instance of the servile adulation which the subjects of the czar deem it necessary to adopt the blessing of the troops who knelt devoutly before his majesty was a profoundly moving spectacle his majesty held the sacred icon aloft and pronounced aloud a blessing in his own name and that of the empress thousands wept with emotion and spiritual ecstasy pupils of girls schools scattered roses in the path of the monarch people pressed up to the carriage in order to carry away an indelible memory of the hallowed features of the lord's anointed many old people had spent the night in prayer and fasting in order to be worthy to gaze at his countenance with pure undefiled souls the greatest enthusiasm prevails at the happiness thus vouchsafed to the people moved how shameful how pitiful and how grotesque to think it was i that did those cruel things there is no escaping the personal responsibility it was i that did them and it was i that got that groveling and awe-smitten worship i this thing in the mirror this carrot with one hand i flogged unoffending women to death and tortured prisoners to unconsciousness and with the other i held up the fetish toward my fellow deity in heaven and called down his blessing upon my adoring animals whom and whose forbears with his holy approval i and mine have been instructing in the pains of hell for four lagging centuries it is a picture to think that this thing in the mirror this vegetable is an accepted deity to a mighty nation an innumerable host and nobody laughs and at the same time is a diligent and practical professional devil and nobody marvels nobody murmurs about incongruities and inconsistencies is the human race a joke was it devised and patched together in a dull time when there was nothing more important to do has it no respect for itself i think my respect for it is drooping sinking and my respect for myself along with it there is but one restorative clothes respect reviving spirit uplifting clothes heaven's kindliest gift to man his only protection against finding himself out they deceive him they confer dignity upon him without them he has none how charitable are clothes how beneficent how puissant how inestimably precious mine are able to expand a human cipher into a globe shadowing portent they can command the respect of the whole world including my own which is fading i will put them on mark twain End of the Tsar's Soliloquy by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman This is Section 5 of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume 1. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. English as she is taught by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. In the appendix to Crocker's Boswell's Johnson, one finds this anecdote Cato's Soliloquy. One day Mrs. Gastrell sent a little girl to repeat to him, Dr. Samuel Johnson, Cato's Soliloquy, which she went through very correctly. The doctor, after a pause, asked the child, What was to bring Cato to an end? She said it was a knife. No, my dear, it was not so. My Aunt Polly said it was a knife. Why, Aunt Polly's knife may do, but it was a dagger, my dear. He then asked her the meaning of bane and antidote, which she was unable to give. Mrs. Gastro said, You cannot expect so young a child to know the meaning of such words. He then said, My dear, how many pence are there in sixpence? I cannot tell, sir, was the half-terrified reply. On this, addressing himself to Mrs. Gastrell, he said, Now, my dear lady, can anything be more ridiculous than to teach a child Cato's soliloquy who does not know how many pence there are in sixpence? In a lecture before the Royal Geographical Society, Professor Ravenstein quoted the following list of frantic questions and said that they had been asked in an examination. Mention all the names of places in the world derived from Julius Caesar or Augustus Caesar. Where are the following rivers? Pisuarga, Sagaria, Guadalete, Calon, Mulde. All you know of the following. Machacha, Pilmo, Shebolos, Crivosia, Basex, Manaikert, Taxhen, Sito, Meloria, Sutfen, the highest peaks of the Karakorum range, the number of universities in Prussia. Why are the tops of mountains continually covered with snow? Sick. Name the length and breadth of the streams of lava which issued from the Skaptar Jokul in the eruption of 1783. That list would oversize nearly anybody's geographical knowledge. Isn't it reasonably possible that in our schools many of the questions in all studies are several miles ahead of where the pupil is, that he is set to struggle with things that are ludicrously beyond his present reach, hopelessly beyond his present strength? This remark in passing, and by way of text, now I come to what I was going to say. I have just now fallen upon a darling literary curiosity. It is a little book, a manuscript compilation, and the compiler sent it to me with the request that I say whether I think it ought to be published or not. I said yes, but as I slowly grow wise, I briskly grow cautious, and so, now that the publication is imminent, it has seemed to me that I should feel more comfortable if I could divide up this responsibility with the public by adding them to the court. Therefore I will print some extracts from the book, in the hope that they may make converts to my judgment that the volume has merit which entitles it to publication. As to its character, every one has sampled English as she is spoke, and English as she is wrote. This little volume furnishes us an instructive array of examples of English as she is taught. In the public schools of, uh, well, this country. The collection is made by a teacher in those schools, and all the examples in it are genuine. None of them have been tampered with or doctored in any way. From time to time, during several years, whenever a pupil has delivered himself of anything peculiarly quaint or toothsome in the course of his recitations, 
this teacher and her associates have privately set that thing down in a memorandum book strictly following the original as to grammar construction spelling and all and the result is this literary curiosity the contents of the book consist mainly of answers given by the boys and girls to questions said answers being given sometimes verbally sometimes in writing the subjects touched upon are fifteen in number one etymology two grammar three mathematics four geography five original six analysis seven history eight intellectual nine philosophy ten physiology eleven astronomy twelve politics thirteen music fourteen oratory fifteen metaphysics you perceive that the poor little young idea has taken a shot at a good many kinds of game in the course of the book now as to results here are some quaint definitions of words it will be noticed that in all of these instances the sound of the word or the look of it on paper has misled the child aborigines a system of mountains alias a good man in the bible amenable anything that is mean assiduity state of being an acid auriferous pertaining to an orifice ammonia the food of the gods capillary a little caterpillar corniferous rocks in which fossil corn is found emolument a headstone to a grave equestrian one who asks questions eucharist one who plays euchre franchise anything belonging to the french idolator a very idle person ipecac a man who likes a good dinner irrigate to make fun of mendacious what can be mended mercenary one who feels for another parasite a kind of umbrella parasite the murder of an infant publican a man who does his prayers in public tenacious ten acres of land here is one where the phrase publicans and sinners has got mixed up in the child's mind with politics and the result is a definition which takes one in a sudden and unexpected way republican a sinner mentioned in the bible also in democratic newspapers now and then here are two where the mistake has resulted from sound assisted by remote fact plagiarist a writer of plays demagogue a vessel containing beer and other liquids i cannot quite make out what it was that misled the pupil in the following instances it would not seem to have been the sound of the word nor the look of it in print asphyxia a grumbling fussy temper quaterians a bird with a flat beak and no bill living in new zealand quaternions the name given to a style of art practiced by the phoenicians quaternions a religious convention held every hundred years sibilant the state of being idiotic crozier a staff carried by the deity in the following sentences the pupil's ear has been deceiving him again the marriage was illegible he was totally dismasted with the whole performance he enjoys riding on a philosopher she was very quick at repertoire he prayed for the waters to subsidize the leopard is watching his sheep they had a strawberry vestibule here is one which well now 
how often we do slam right into the truth without ever suspecting it the men employed by the gas company go round and speculate the meter indeed they do dear and when you grow up many and many's the time you will notice it in the gas bill in the following sentences the little people have some information to convey every time but in my case they failed to connect the light always went out on the keystone word the coercion of some things is remarkable as bread and molasses her hat is contiguous because she wears it on one side he preached to an egregious congregation the captain eliminated a bullet through the man's heart you should take caution and be precarious the supercilious girl acted with vicissitude when the perennial time came that last is a curiously plausible sentence one seems to know what it means and yet he knows all the time that he doesn't here is an odd but entirely proper use of a word and a most sudden descent from a lofty philosophical altitude to a very practical and homely illustration we should endeavor to avoid extremes like those of wasps and bees and here with zoological and geological in his mind but not ready to his tongue the small scholar has innocently gone and let out a couple of secrets which ought never to have been divulged in any circumstances there are a good many donkeys in theological gardens some of the best fossils are found in theological cabinets under the head of grammar the little scholars furnish the following information gender is the distinguishing nouns without regard to sex a verb is something to eat adverbs should always be used as adjectives and adjectives as adverbs every sentence and name of god must begin with a caterpillar caterpillar is well enough but capital letter would have been stricter the following is a brave attempt at a solution but it failed to liquefy when they are going to say some prose or poetry before they say the poetry or prose they must put a semicolon just after the introduction of the prose or poetry the chapter on mathematics is full of fruit for it i take a few samples mainly in an unripe state a straight line is any distance between two places parallel lines are lines that can never meet until they run together a circle is a round straight line with a hole in the middle things which are equal to each other are equal to anything else to find the number of square feet in a room you multiply the room by the number of the feet the product is the result right you are in the matter of geography this little book is unspeakably rich the questions do not appear to have applied the microscope to the subject as did those quoted by professor ravenstein still they proved plenty difficult enough without that these pupils did not hunt with a microscope they hunted with a shotgun this is shown by the crippled condition of the game they brought in america is divided into the pacific slope and the mississippi valley north america is separated by spain america consists from north to south about five hundred miles the united states is quite a small country compared with some other countries but is about as industrious the capital of the united states is long island the five seaports of the u s are newfoundland and san francisco the principal products of the u s is earthquakes and volcanoes the alleghenies are mountains in philadelphia the rocky mountains are on the western side of philadelphia 
cape hatteras is a vast body of water surrounded by land and flowing into the gulf of mexico mason and dixon's line is the equator one of the leading industries of the united states is molasses book covers numbers gas teaching lumber manufacturers paper making publishers coal in austria the principal occupation is gathering ostrich feathers gibraltar is an island built on a rock russia is very cold and tyrannical sicily is one of the sandwich islands hindustan flows through the ganges and empties into the mediterranean sea ireland is called the emigrant isle because it is so beautiful and green the width of the different zones europe lies in depend upon the surrounding country the imports of a country are the things that are paid for the exports are the things that are not climate lasts all the time and weather only a few days the two most famous volcanoes of europe are sodom and gomorrah the chapter headed analysis shows us that the pupils in our public schools are not merely loaded up with those showy facts about geography mathematics and so on and left in that incomplete state no there's machinery for clarifying and expanding their minds they are required to take poems and analyze them dig out their common sense reduce them to statistics and reproduce them in a luminous prose translation which shall tell you at a glance what the poet was trying to get at one sample will do here is a stanza from the lady of the lake followed by the pupil's impressive explanation of it alone but with unbated zeal the horseman plied with scourge and steel for jaded now and spent with toil embossed with foam and dark with soil while every gasp with sobs he drew the laboring stag strained full in view the man who rode on the horse performed the whip and an instrument made of steel alone with strong ardor not diminishing for being tired from the time passed with hard labor overworked with anger and ignorant with weariness while every breath for labor he drew with cries full of sorrow the young deer made imperfect who worked hard filtered in sight i see now that i never understood that poem before i have had glimpses of its meaning in moments when i was not as ignorant with weariness as usual but this is the first time the whole spacious idea of it ever filtered in sight if i were a public school pupil i would put those other studies aside and stick to analysis for after all it is the thing to spread your mind we come now to historical matters historical remains one might say as one turns the pages he is impressed with the depth to which one date has been driven into the american child's head fourteen ninety two the date is there and it is there to stay and it is always at hand always deliverable at a moment's notice but the fact that belongs with it that is quite another matter only the date itself is familiar and sure its vast fact has failed of lodgment it would appear that whenever you ask a public school pupil when a thing anything no matter what happened and he is in doubt he always rips out his fourteen ninety two he applies it to everything from the landing of the ark to the introduction of the horse car well after all it is our first date and so it is right enough to honor it and pay the public schools to teach our children to honor it george washington was born in fourteen ninety two washington wrote the declaration of independence in fourteen ninety two st bartholomew was massacred in fourteen ninety two the britons were the saxons who entered england in fourteen ninety two under julius caesar 
the earth is one thousand four hundred and ninety two miles in circumference to proceed with history christopher columbus was called the father of his country queen isabella of spain sold her watch and chain and other millinery so that columbus could discover america the indian wars were very desecrating to the country the indians pursued their warfare by hiding in the bushes and then scalping them captain john smith has been styled the father of his country his life was saved by his daughter pocahontas the puritans found an insane asylum in the wilds of america the stamp act was to make everybody stamp all materials so they should be null and void washington died in spain almost broken-hearted his remains were taken to the cathedral in havana guerrilla warfare was where men rode on guerrillas john brown was a very good insane man who tried to get fugitive slaves into virginia he captured all the inhabitants but was finally conquered and condemned to his death the confederacy was formed by the fugitive slaves alfred the great reigned eight hundred and seventy two years he was distinguished for letting some buckwheat cakes burn and the lady scolded him henry eight was famous for being a great widower having lost several wives lady jane gray studied greek and latin and was beheaded after a few days john bright is noted for an incurable disease lord james gordon bennett instigated the gordon riots the middle ages come in between antiquity and posterity luther introduced christianity into england a good many thousand years ago his birthday was november eighteen eighty three he was once a pope he lived at the time of the rebellion of worms julius caesar is noted for his famous telegram dispatch i came i saw i conquered julius caesar was really a very great man he was a very great soldier and wrote a book for beginners in the latin cleopatra was caused by the death of an asp which she dissolved in a wine cup the only form of government in greece was a limited monkey the persian war lasted about five hundred years greece had only seven wise men socrates destroyed some statues and had to drink shamrock here is a fact correctly stated and yet it is phrased with such ingenious infelicity that it can be depended upon to convey misinformation every time it is uncarefully read by the salic law no woman or descendant of a woman could occupy the throne to show how far a child can travel in history with judicious and diligent boosting in the public school we select the following mosaic abraham lincoln was born in wales in fifteen ninety nine in the chapter headed intellectual i find a great number of most interesting statements a sample or two may be found not amiss bracebridge hall was written by henry irving snowbound was written by peter cooper the house of the seven gables was written by lord bryant edgar a poe was a very curdling writer cotton mather was a writer who invented the cotton gin and wrote histories beowulf wrote the scriptures ben jonson survived shakespeare in some respects in the canterbury tale it gives account of king alfred on his way to the shrine of thomas bucket chaucer was the father of english pottery chaucer was a bland verse writer of the third century chaucer was succeeded by h wads longfellow an american writer his writings were chiefly prose and nearly one hundred years elapsed shakespeare translated the scriptures and it was called st james because he did it in the middle of the chapter i find many pages of information concerning shakespeare's plays milton's plays and those of bacon addison samuel johnson fielding 
Richardson, Stern, Smollett, Defoe, Locke, Pope, Swift, Goldsmith, Burns, Cowper, Wordsworth, Gibbon, Byron, Coleridge, Hood, Scott, Macaulay, George Eliot, Dickens, Bulwer, Thackeray, Browning, Mrs. Browning, Tennyson, and Disraeli, a fact which shows that into the restricted stomach of the public school pupil is shoveled every year the blood, bone, and viscera of a gigantic literature, and the same is there digested and disposed of in a most successful and characteristic and gratifying public school way. I have space for but a trifling few of the results. Lord Byron was the son of an heiress and a drunken man. William Wordsworth wrote The Barefoot Boy and Imitations on Immortality. Gibbon wrote a history of his travels in Italy. This was original. George Eliot left a wife and children who mourned greatly for his genius. George Eliot, Miss Mary Evans, Mrs. Cross, Mrs. Lewis, was the greatest female poet unless George Sands is made an exception of. Bulwell is considered a good writer. Sir Walter Scott, Charles Bronte, Alfred the Great, and Johnson were the first great novelists. Thomas Babington Mackerley graduated at Harvard and then studied law. He was raised to the peerage as baron in 1557 and died in 1776. Here are two or three miscellaneous facts that may be of value if taken in moderation. Homer's writings are Homer's Essays, Virgil the Aeneid, and Paradise Lost, some people say that these poems were not written by Homer, but by another man of the same name. A sort of sadness kind of shone in Bryant's poems. Holmes is a very profligate and amusing writer. When the public school pupil wrestles with the political features of the great republic, they throw him sometimes. A bill becomes a law when the president vetoes it. The three departments of the government is the president rules the world, the governor rules the state, the mayor rules the city. The first conscientious Congress met in Philadelphia. The Constitution of the United States was established to ensure domestic hostility. Truth crushed to earth will rise again as follows. The Constitution of the United States is that part of the book at the end which nobody reads. And here she rises once more, and untimely. There should be a limit to public school instruction. It cannot be wise or well to let the young find out everything. Congress is divided into civilized half, civilized, and savage. Here are some results of study in music and oratory. An interval in music is the distance on the keyboard from one piano to the next. A rest means you are not to sing it. Emphasis is putting more distress on one word than another. The chapter on physiology contains much that ought not to be lost to science. Physiology is to study about your bones, stomach, and vertebrae. Occupations which are injurious to health are carbolic acid gas, which is impure blood. We have an upper and lower skin. The lower skin moves all the time, and the upper skin moves when we do. The body is mostly composed of water, and about one-half is avaricious tissue. The stomach is a small pear-shaped bone situated in the body. The gastric juice keeps the bones from creaking. The chyle flows up the middle of the backbone and reaches the heart where it meets the oxygen and is purified. The salivary glands are used to salivate the body. In the stomach, starch is changed to cane sugar and cane sugar to sugar cane. 
the olfactory nerve enters the cavity of the orbit and is developed into the special sense of hearing the growth of a tooth begins in the back of the mouth and extends to the stomach if we were on a railroad track and a train was coming the train would deafen our ears so that we couldn't see to get off the track if up to this point none of my quotations have added flavor to the johnsonian anecdote at the head of this article let us make another attempt the theory that intuitive truths are discovered by the light of nature originated from st john's interpretation of a passage in the gospel of plato the weight of the earth is found by comparing a mass of known lead with that of a mass of unknown lead to find the weight of the earth take the length of a degree on a meridian and multiply by sixty two and a half pounds the spheres are to each other as the squares of their homologous sides a body will go just as far in the first second as the body will go plus the force of gravity and that's equal to twice what the body will go specific gravity is the weight to be compared weight of an equal volume of or that is the weight of a body compared with the weight of an equal volume the law of fluid pressure divide the different forms of organized bodies by the form of attraction and the number increased will be the form inertia is that probity of bodies by virtue of which it cannot change its own condition of rest or motion in other words it is the negative quality of passiveness either in recoverable latency or incipient latescence if a laugh is fair here not the struggling child nor the unintelligent teacher or rather the unintelligent boards committees and trustees are the proper target for it all through this little book one detects the signs of a certain probable fact that a large part of the pupil's instruction consists in cramming him with obscure and wordy rules which he does not understand and has no time to understand it would be as useful to cram him with brickbats they would at least stay in a town in the interior of new york a few years ago a gentleman set forth a mathematical problem and proposed to give a prize to every public school pupil who should furnish the correct solution of it twenty-two of the brightest boys in the public schools entered the contest the problem was not a very difficult one for pupils of their mathematical rank and standing yet they all failed by a hair through one trifling mistake or another some searching questions were asked when it turned out that these lads were as glib as parrots with the rules but could not reason out a single rule or explain the principle underlying it their memories had been stocked but not their understandings it was a case of brickbat culture pure and simple there are several curious compositions in the little book and we must make room for one it is full of naivete brutal truth and unembarrassed directness and is the funniest genuine boy's composition i think i have ever seen on girls girls are very stuck up and dignified in their manner and be have your they think more of dress than anything and like to play with dowels and rags they cry if they see a cow in a far distance and are afraid of guns they stay at home all the time and go to church on sunday they are always sick they are always foony and making fun of boys hands and they say how dirty they can't play marbles i pity them poor things they make fun of boys and then turn round and love them i don't believe they ever killed a cat or anything they look out every night and say oh aunt the moon lovely there is one thing i have not told and that is they always now their lessons better than boys 
from Mr. Edward Channing's recent article in Science, the marked difference between the books now being produced by French, English, and American travelers, on the one hand, and German explorers on the other, is too great to escape attention. That difference is due entirely to the fact that in school and university the German is taught, in the first place, to see, and in the second place to understand what he does see. Mark Twain End of English as She is Taught by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman This is Section 6 of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume 1, by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Grasses in the South, by Mark Twain, read by John Greenman. The following is taken from that able and excellent weekly, the Mobile Sunday Times, whose agricultural columns are edited by C. C. Langdon, Esquire. The following communication is from a veteran southern agriculturist, a gentleman of high character and great intelligence, who, before the war, was not only a large cotton planter, but, at the same time, a successful farmer, horticulturist, pomologist, and stock-raiser. No man in the South has done more than he to prove the perfect adaptation of our soil and climate to that diversification of pursuits which the stern logic of events has rendered necessary to the future prosperity of the land we love. We will vouch for the entire truthfulness of all the statements of our correspondent. What he has done, others can do, if they will. Stonewall, Mississippi, May 21, 1868 Honorable C. C. Langdon, under your department in the Sunday Times, I read, the cotton theorists hold that farm products and the rearing of horses, cattle, hogs, etc., cannot be made to pay or to compete with colder climates, because they say that the grasses cannot endure the heat and dryness of our long summers. I am satisfied that this is a mistake, and I feel certain that no scientific and careful test has yet been made of the fitness of our climate for these, I will call them, pastoral grasses. See page 6, May 17, signed Ben Lane. Will you allow Mark Twain to say he had clover in 1837 and up to May 1863 when he abdicated his high calling in favor of the hired foreign soldiery of the best government the world ever saw? There may have been no scientific and careful tests, but nevertheless for over twenty years in latitude thirty-two degrees I had the clovers having tried the red, white, yellow, scarlet, as also of the grasses blue, timothy, orchard, red top, and largely of the Bermuda, at least enough of pastoral grasses. I call them the cultivated grasses, to distinguish them from the wild grasses or natures, though some of these do not succeed unless the land is in a state of culture, the crab and crowfoot, for instance. If Ben Lane had visited Mark Twain from 1840 to 1860, he would have seen those grasses. And I, a cotton theorist, affirm after thirty-five years' experience, no science in the cotton field, that we cannot compete with colder climates, the same policy pursued, change the policy put the land in a state of drainage when it will bear subsoiling twelve to eighteen inches deep then sow the grasses profusely and mark twain pledges his good name that no climate outside of the ruinated spoiled confederacy can compete with us 
when i left never to return to my home i had largely for my means horses cattle hogs sheep and goats never permitting one of them outside of my fence unless taken out for use i had brood mares a pure morgan stallion an imported jack thoroughbred devon bulls thoroughbred imported ayrshire bulls and sent off just before i dodged out after the clock on my mantel chimed low twelve and lay out in the swamp until peep a day and left forever a south down ram imported in his dam he cost only six hundred dollars with south down and pure saxon and merino ewes sufficient i had over one hundred head of horses mules colts and fine cattle that never needed to be fed from corn-house or barn there being pastoral grasses enough for them three hundred and sixty-five days in each year others can do this if they will and until southern men become planters and look the necessity of the thing square in the face and act up to duty we will be always dependent upon the northern men and the eastern who have no more love for me us than i we have for them i use somebody's fictitious name for this time mark twain end of grasses in the south by mark twain read by john greenman this is section seven of mark twain's journal writings volume one by mark twain this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hawaii by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman No alien land in all the world has any deep, strong charm for me but that one. No other land could so longingly and beseechingly haunt me, sleeping and waking, through half a lifetime, as that one has done. Other things leave me, but it abides. Other things change, but it remains the same. For me, its balmy airs are always blowing, its summer seas flashing in the sun. The pulsing of its surf beat is in my ear. I can see its garland crags, its leaping cascades, its plumy palms drowsing by the shore its remote summits floating like islands above the cloud-rack. I can feel the spirit of its woodland solitude. I can hear the plash of its brooks. In my nostrils still lives the breath of flowers that perished twenty years ago. Mark Twain End of Hawaii by Mark Twain Read by John Greenman This is Section 8 of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume 1, by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Helpless Situation, by Mark Twain, read by John Greenman. Once or twice a year I get a letter of a certain pattern, a pattern that never materially changes in form and substance, yet I cannot get used to that letter. It always astonishes me it affects me as the locomotive always affects me i say to myself i have seen you a thousand times you always look the same way yet you are always a wonder and you are always impossible to contrive you is clearly beyond human genius you can't exist you don't exist yet here you are i have a letter of that kind by me a very old one i yearn to print it and where is the harm the writer of it is dead years ago no doubt and if i conceal her name and address her this world address i am sure her shade will not mind and with it i wish to print the answer which i wrote at the time but probably did not send if it went which is not likely it went in the form of a copy for I find the original still here, pigeonholed with the said letter. 
to that kind of letters we all write answers which we do not send fearing to hurt where we have no desire to hurt and i have done it many a time and this is doubtless a case of the sort the letter x california june three eighteen seventy nine mr s l clemens hartford connecticut dear sir you will doubtless be surprised to know who has presumed to write and ask a favor of you let your memory go back to your days in the humboldt mines sixty two sixty three you will remember you and claggett and oliver and the old blacksmith tulu lived in a lean-to which was halfway up the gulch and there were six log cabins in the camp strung pretty well separated up the gulch from its mouth at the desert to where the last claim was at the divide the lean-to you lived in was the one with a canvas roof that the cow fell down through one night as told about by you in roughing it my uncle simmons remembers it very well he lived in the principal cabin halfway up the divide along with dixon and parker and smith it had two rooms one for kitchen and the other for bunks and was the only one that had you and your party were there on the great night the time they had dried apple pie uncle simmons often speaks of it it seems curious that dried apple pie should have seemed such a great thing but it was and it shows how far humboldt was out of the world and difficult to get to and how slim the regular bill of fare was sixteen years ago it is a long time i was a little girl then only fourteen i never saw you i lived in washoe but uncle simmons ran across you every now and then all during those weeks that you and party were there working your claim which was like the rest the camp played out long and long ago there wasn't silver enough in it to make a button you never saw my husband but he was there after you left and lived in that very lean-to a bachelor then but married to me now he often wishes there had been a photographer there in those days he would have taken the lean-to he got hurt in the old hal clayton claim that was abandoned like the others putting in a blast and not climbing out quick enough though he scrambled the best he could it landed him clear down on the trail and hit a paiute for weeks they thought he would not get over it but he did and is all right now has been ever since this is a long introduction but it is the only way i can make myself known the favor i ask i feel assured your generous heart will grant give me some advice about a book i have written i do not claim anything for it only it is mostly true and as interesting as most of the books of the times i am unknown in the literary world and you know what that means unless one has someone of influence like yourself to help you by speaking a good word for you i would like to place the book on royalty basis plan with any one you would suggest this is a secret from my husband and family i intend it as a surprise in case i get it published feeling you will take an interest in this and if possible write me a letter to some publisher or better still if you could see them for me and then let me hear i appeal to you to grant me this favor with deepest gratitude i thank you for your attention one knows without inquiring that the twin of that embarrassing letter is forever and ever flying in this and that and the other direction across the continent in the mails daily nightly hourly unceasingly unrestingly it goes to every well-known merchant and railway official and manufacturer and capitalist and mayor and congressman and governor and editor and publisher and author and broker and banker in a word to every person who is supposed to have influence it always follows the one pattern 
you do not know me but you once knew a relative of mine etc etc we should all like to help the applicants we should all be glad to do it we should all like to return the sort of answer that is desired but well there is not a thing we can do that would be a help for not in any instance does that letter ever come from any one who can be helped the struggler whom you could help does his own helping it would not occur to him to apply to you a stranger he has talent and knows it and he goes into his fight eagerly and with energy and determination all alone preferring to be alone that pathetic letter which comes to you from the incapable the unhelpable how do you who are familiar with it answer it what do you find to say you do not want to inflict a wound you hunt ways to avoid that what do you find how do you get out of your hard place with a contented conscience do you try to explain the old reply of mine to such a letter shows that i tried that once was i satisfied with the result possibly and possibly not probably not almost certainly not i have long ago forgotten all about it but anyway i append my effort the reply i know mr h and i will go to him dear madam if upon reflection you find you still desire it there will be a conversation i know the form it will take it will be like this mr h how do her books strike you mr clemens i am not acquainted with them h who has been her publisher c i don't know h she has one i suppose c i i think not h ah you think this is her first book c yes i suppose so i, I think so h what is it about what is the character of it c i believe i do not know h have you seen it c well no i haven't h ah, ah how long have you known her c well, i don't know her h don't know her c no h ah <laughs> uh, how did you come to be interested in her book then c well she she wrote and asked me to find a publisher for her and mentioned you h why should she apply to you instead of to me c she wished me to use my influence h dear me what has influence to do with such a matter c well i think she thought you would be more likely to examine her book if you were influenced h why what we are here for is to examine books anybody's book that comes along it's our business why should we turn away a book unexamined because it's a stranger's it would be foolish no publisher does it on what ground did she request your influence since you do not know her she must have thought you knew her literature and could speak for it is that it c no she knew i didn't h well what then she had a reason of some sort for believing you competent to recommend her literature and also under obligation to do it c yes i i knew her uncle h knew her uncle c yes h upon my word so you knew her uncle her uncle knows her literature he endorses it to you the chain is complete nothing further needed you are satisfied and therefore see no that isn't all there are other ties i knew the cabin her uncle lived in in the mines i knew his partners too also i came near knowing her husband before she married him and i did know the abandoned shaft where a premature blast went off and he went flying through the air and clear down to the trail and 
hit an indian in the back with almost fatal consequences h to him or to the indian c uh, she didn't say which it was h with a sigh it certainly beats the band you don't know her you don't know her literature you don't know who got hurt when the blast went off you don't know a single thing for us to build an estimate of her book upon so far as i see i knew her uncle you are forgetting her uncle h oh w what use is he did you know him long how long was it c well i don't know that i really knew him but i must have met him anyway about sixteen years ago h what a basis to judge a book upon at first you said you knew him and now you don't know whether you did or not c oh yes i knew him anyway i think i thought i did i'm perfectly certain of it h what makes you think you thought you knew him c why she says i did herself h she says so c yes she does and i did know him too though i don't remember it now h come how can you know it when you don't remember it c i don't know that is i don't know the process but i do know lots of things that i don't remember and remember lots of things that i don't know it's so with every educated person h after a pause is your time valuable c no well not very h mine is so i came away then because he was looking tired overwork i reckon i never do that i have seen the evil effects of it my mother was always afraid i would overwork myself but i never did dear madam you would see how it would happen if i went there he would ask me those questions and i would try to answer them to suit him and he would hunt me here and there and yonder and get me embarrassed more and more all the time and at last he would look tired on account of overwork and there it would end and nothing done i wish i could be useful to you but you see they do not care for uncles or any of those things it doesn't move them it doesn't have the least effect they don't care for anything but the literature itself and they as good as despise influence but they do care for books and are eager to get them and examine them no matter whence they come nor from whose pen if you will send yours to a publisher any publisher he will certainly examine it i can assure you of that mark twain end of a helpless situation by mark twain read by john greenman this is section nine of mark twain's journal writings volume one by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain how i escaped being killed in a duel by mark twain read by john greenman the only merit i claim for the following narrative is that it is a true story it has a moral at the end of it but i claim nothing on that as it is merely thrown in to curry favor with the religious element after i had reported a couple of years on the virginia city nevada daily enterprise they promoted me to be editor-in-chief and i lasted just a week by the watch but i made an uncommonly lively newspaper while i did last and when i retired i had a duel on my hands and three horsewhippings promised me the latter i made no attempt to collect however this history concerns only the former it was the old flush times of the silver excitement when the population was wonderfully wild and mixed everybody went armed to the teeth and all slights and insults had to be atoned for with the best article of blood your system could furnish in the course of my editing i made trouble with mr lord editor of the rival paper 
he flew up about some little trifle or other that i said about him i do not remember now what it was i suppose i called him a thief or a body snatcher or an idiot or something like that i was obliged to make the paper readable and i could not fail in my duty to a whole community of subscribers merely to save the exaggerated sensitiveness of an individual mr lord was offended and replied vigorously in his paper vigorously means a great deal when it refers to a personal editorial in a frontier newspaper dueling was all the fashion among the upper classes in that country and very few gentlemen would throw away an opportunity of fighting one to kill a person in a duel caused a man to be even more looked up to than to kill two men in the ordinary way well out there if you abused a man and that man did not like it you had to call him out and kill him otherwise you would be disgraced so i challenged mr lord and i did hope he would not accept but i knew perfectly well that he did not want to fight and so i challenged him in the most violent and implacable manner and then i sat down and suffered and suffered till the answer came all our boys the editors were in our office helping me in the dismal business and telling about duels and discussing the code with a lot of aged ruffians who had had experience in such things and altogether there was a loving interest taken in the matter which made me unspeakably uncomfortable the answer came mr lord declined our boys were furious and so was i on the surface i sent him another challenge and another and another and the more he did not want to fight the bloodthirstier i became but at last the man's tone changed he appeared to be waking up it was becoming apparent that he was going to fight me after all i ought to have known how it would be he was a man who never could be depended upon our boys were exultant i was not though i tried to be it was now time to go out and practice it was the custom there to fight duels with navy six-shooters at fifteen paces load and empty till the game for the funeral was secured we went to a little ravine just outside of town and borrowed a barn door for a target borrowed it of a gentleman who was absent and we stood this barn door up and stood a rail on end against the middle of it to represent lord and put a squash on top of the rail to represent his head he was a very tall lean creature the poorest sort of material for a duel nothing but a line shot could fetch him and even then he might split your bullet exaggeration aside the rail was of course a little too thin to represent his body accurately but the squash was all right if there was any intellectual difference between the squash and his head it was in favor of the squash well i practiced and practiced at the barn door and could not hit it and i practiced at the rail and could not hit that and i tried hard for the squash and could not hit the squash i would have been entirely disheartened but that occasionally i crippled one of the boys and that encouraged me to hope at last we began to hear pistol shots nearby in the next ravine we knew what that meant the other party were out practicing too then i was in the last degree distressed for of course those people would hear our shots and they would send spies over the ridge and the spies would find my barn door without a wound or a scratch and that would simply be the end of me for of course that other man would immediately become as bloodthirsty as i was just at this moment a little bird no larger than a sparrow flew by and lit on a sage bush about thirty paces away and my little second steve gillis who was a matchless marksman with a pistol much better than i was snatched out his revolver and shot the bird's head off we all ran to pick up the game and sure enough just at this moment some of the other duelists came reconnoitering over the little ridge they ran to our group to see what the matter was and when they saw the bird lord second said that was a splendid shot how far off was it steve said with some indifference oh 
no great distance about thirty paces thirty paces heavens alive who did it my man twain the mischief he did can he do that often well yes he can do it about well about four times out of five i knew the little rascal was lying but i never said anything i never told him so he was not of a disposition to invite confidences of that kind so i let the matter rest but it was a comfort to see those people look sick and see their under jaws drop when steve made these statements they went off and got lord and took him home and when we got home half an hour later there was a note saying that mr lord peremptorily declined to fight it was a narrow escape we found out afterwards that lord hit his mark thirteen times in eighteen shots if he had put those thirteen bullets through me it would have narrowed my sphere of usefulness a good deal would have well-nigh closed it in fact true they could have put pegs in the holes and used me for a hat-rack but what is a hat-rack to a man who feels he has intellectual powers i would scorn such a position i have written this true incident of my personal history for one purpose and one purpose only to warn the youth of the day against the pernicious practice of dueling and to plead with them to war against it if the remarks and suggestions i am making can be of any service to sunday-school teachers and newspapers interested in the moral progress of society they are at liberty to use them and i shall even be grateful to have them widely disseminated so that they may do as much good as possible i was young and foolish when i challenged that gentleman and i thought it was very fine and very grand to be a duelist and stand upon the field of honor but i am older and more experienced now and i am inflexibly opposed to the dreadful custom i am glad indeed to be enabled to lift up my voice against it i think it is a bad immoral thing i think it is every man's duty to do everything he can to discourage dueling i always do now i discourage it upon every occasion if a man were to challenge me now now that i can fully appreciate the iniquity of that practice i would go to that man and take him by the hand lead him to a quiet retired room and kill him end of how i escaped being killed in a duel by mark twain read by john greenman this is section 10 of mark twain's journal writings volume 1 by mark twain this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newsletter and California Advertiser, June 13, 1868, Important to Whom It May Concern, by Mark Twain. Read by John Greenman. Mrs. Editors, I was expecting to sail for New York in the Pacific Mail Steamship Company's steamer of the 18th June, but unforeseen circumstances compel a delay of a few days. I cannot sail till the thirtieth of the month. It is therefore proper that I should give this notice to those friends who have entrusted articles to my care for delivery to their relatives in the Atlantic States, so that they can send by parties who sail on the eighteenth such of them as demand expedition. I will give a list of the things I am speaking of, and those which will admit of delay until the thirtieth can remain in my possession one violin one double-barreled gun one package books one ditto sheet music negro ballads one set casters vinegar cruet missing two scratch wigs for repair one woman seven boxes and one barrel ore specimens one amalgamating pan for repair one parrot one pup one cage canaries two dead another woman eighteen mining company prospectuses marked please circulate one valise appears to be nothing in it six photographs consigned to different parties one volume tennyson 
one white woman one box salve two accordions one overcoat one set chessmen one cow one sandalwood fan one rosewood dressing case four meerschaum pipes two specimen pins some grass widows one hoe steam press for repairs one unabridged dictionary nine bandboxes one lunatic for asylum one idiot for paris one gridiron one baby sixty-eight letters one package gold coin one ditto greenbacks twenty-three trunks another woman besides these articles i have to carry along a valise for myself and a jug and i may be discommoded unless some of the things go by the steamer of the eighteenth the baby is not well and appears to get worse all the time i think maybe it has got the mumps or the consumption or something of that kind those are things i do not know anything about it must be one of those because i have doctored it for fits and measles and all those things but still she grows worse she had better go by the steamer of the eighteenth i do not think she will keep for the thirtieth to tell the plain truth i am sorry i agreed to take this baby along a baby is too troublesome altogether too troublesome i have had a baby at sea and i know once i had twins on a ship and i never suffered so much in my life please come and take this one and ship it per steamer of the eighteenth most of the articles had better go at the same time especially the cow and the idiot if i were relieved of those i could take some more women and maybe another trunk or two mark twain end of important to whom it may concern by mark twain read by john greenman this is section eleven of mark twain's journal writings volume one by mark twain this librivox recording is in the public domain taken from adventures of huckleberry finn the century a popular quarterly magazine january eighteen eighty five printed jim's investments and king solomon by mark twain read by john greenman jim knowed all kinds of signs he said he knowed most everything i said it looked to me like all the signs was about bad luck and so i asked him if there weren't any good luck signs he says mighty few and they ain't no use to body <laughs> what you want to know when good luck's come for uh, want to keep it off and he said if you's got hairy arms and hairy breasts it's a sign that you're going to be rich well there's some use in a sign like that cause it's so fur ahead you see maybe you's got to be poor a long time first and so you might get discouraged and kill yourself if uh, didn't know by the sign that you're going to be rich by by you got hairy arms and a hairy breast jim <laughs> what's the use to ask that question don't you see eyes well are you rich no but i've been rich once and going to be rich again once i had fourteen dollars but i tucked to speculating and got busted out what'd you speculate in jim well first i tackled stock what kind of stock why livestock cattle you know i put ten dollars in a cow but i ain't going to risk no more money in stock and the cow up and died on my hands so you lost the ten dollars no i didn't lose it all i only lost about nine of it i sold a hide and tyler for a dollar and ten cents you had five dollars and ten cents left did you speculate any more yes you know that one-legged nigger that belongs to old mr bradish well he sort up a bank and say anybody to put up in a dollar would get four dollars more at the end of the year well all the niggers went in but they didn't have much i was the only one that had much 
so i stuck out for more than four dollars and i said if it didn't get it i'd start a bank myself well of course that nigger wanted to keep me out of the business cause he say they weren't business enough for two banks so he say i could put in my five dollars and he pay me thirty-five at the end of the year so i done it then i reckoned i'd invest the thirty-five dollars right off and keep things a moving and there was a nigger named bob that had catched a wood flat and his master didn't know it and i bought it off him and told him to take the thirty-five dollars when the end of the year come but somebody stole the wood flat that night and next day the one-legged nigger say the bank's busted so they didn't none of us get no money what did you do with the ten cents jim well i was going to spend it but i had a dream and the dream told me to give it to a nigger named balaam balaam zass they call him for short he's one of their um, chuckleheads you know but he's lucky they say and i see i weren't lucky the dream say to let balaam invest the ten cents and he'd make a raise for me well balaam he tucked the money and when he was in church he heard the preacher say that whoever give to the poor lend to the lord and bound to get his money back a hundred times so balaam he tuck and give the ten cents to the poor and laid low to see what was going to come of it well, what did come of it jim nothing never come of it i couldn't manage to collect that money no way and balaam he couldn't i ain't going to lend no more money gotta see the security I'm bound to get into your money back a hundred times the preacher says if i could get the ten cents back i'd call it square i'd be glad of the chance well it's all right anyway jim long as you're going to be rich again some time or other yes nice rich now come to look at it i owns myself nice worth eight hundred dollars but livestock's too resky huck i wished i had the eight hundred dollars and somebody else had the nigger i read considerable to jim about kings and dukes and earls and such and how gaudy they dressed and how much style they put on and called each other your majesty and your grace and your lordship and so on instead of mister jim's eyes bugged out and he was interested and he says i didn't know there was so many of em i ain't heard about none em scarcely but old king solomon unless you counts them kings that's in a pack your cards how much do a king get get i says why they get a thousand dollars a month if they want it they can have just as much as they want everything belongs to them ain't that gay and what they got to do huh they don't do nothing why how you talk they just sit around no is that so of course it is they just sit around except maybe when there's war then they go to the war but other times they just lazy around or go hawking just hawking and sp sh dear noise we skipped out and looked but it weren't nothing but the flutter of a steamboat's wheel away down coming round the point so we come back yes says i and other times when things is dull they fuss with the parliament and if everybody don't get just so he whacks their heads off but mostly they hang around the harem round the witch harem what's the harem no, the place where the, he keeps his wives don't you know about the harem solomon had one he had about a million wives why yes that's so i i done forgot it a harem's a bowden house i reckon most likely they has rackety times in the nursery and i reckon the wives quarrels considerable and that creased the racket yet they say solomon the wisest man that ever live i don't take no stock in that because why would a wise man want to live in the midst of the such a blim blamin all the time no deed he wouldn't a wise man would take him build a biler factory and then he could sit down the biler factory when he want to rest well but he was the wisest man anyway because the widow she told me so her own self 
I don't care what de widder say. He warn't no wise man, nother. He had some of the dat fetches ways I ever see. Did you know about dat child dat he was gwine to chop in two? Yes, the widow told me all about it. Wild Ann, warn't dat the beatinest notion in the world? You just take a look at it a minute. That's the stump. There. That's one of the women. Here's you. That's the other one. It's Solomon. And dis your dollar bills the child. Before you claims it, what does I do? Does I shin around amongst the neighbors and find out which in you the bill do belong to and, and hand it over to the right one, all safe and sound, the way that anybody that had any gumption would? No. I take and whack the bill in two and give half in it to you and the other half to the other woman. That's the way Solomon was going to do with the child. Now, I want to ask you, what's the use to have a bill? Can't buy nothing with it. And what's the use of half a child? I wouldn't give dern for a million of them. But hang it, Jim, you've clean missed the point. Blame it, you've missed it a thousand mile. Who, oh, me? Go along. Don't talk to me about your pants. I reckon I knows sense when I sees it. And they ain't no sense in such doings as dat. Dispute warn't about half a child. Dispute was about a whole child. And a man that think he can settle a dispute about a whole child with a half a child don't know enough to come in out in the rain. Don't talk to me about Solomon, Huck. I knows him by the back. But I tell you, you don't get the point. Blame the pint. I reckon I knows what I knows. And mind you, the real pint is down further. It's down deeper. It lays in the way Solomon was raised. And you take a man that's got only one or two chillin'. Is that man going to be wasteful of chillin'? No, he ain't. He can't afford it. He knows how to value em. But you take a man that's got a, about five million chillin' running around the house, and it's different. He is soon chop a child two as a cat. Days plenty more. A child or two, more or less. Want no consequence to Solomon, Dad fetch him. End of Jim's Investments and King Solomon by Mark Twain. And end of Mark Twain's Journal Writings, Volume 1. Read by John Greenman.